Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. To be from Laramie, John Haynes writes, is to leave it. Only then does Laramie become clearer, which brings you back home. His book, Never Leaving Laramie, covers two decades of world adventures with his Laramie friends. Yet we later feel Haynes' pain and confusion when he steps off a train in the Czech Republic and wakes up a quadriplegic. Author John Haynes, next on Wyoming Chronicle. This program was funded in part by a grant from Newman's Own Foundation, working to nourish the common good by donating all profits from Newman's Own food and beverage products to charitable organizations that seek to make the world a better place. More information is available at newmansownfoundation.org. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. And I want to welcome our viewers to this Wyoming Chronicle with author John Haynes. John, first of all, welcome and thank you for taking the time to visit with us. Oh, thank you, Craig. It's my pleasure. Usually, John, when we have someone on our show, we can... We can distill down their title to one thing like artist or legislator or author. And I was thinking about you and I thought, okay, banker, baker, adventurist, advocate, um, and the list goes on and on. If I were to describe you, John, how would you describe yourself to me? And then we're going to get um, very much into why we're here today. And that's to talk about your book, Never Leaving Laramie Travels in a Restless World. But let's start with how would you describe yourself, John? Let's start there. Huh. Um, that's a fair question. I think I mentioned to somebody recently that uh, I got a degree at University of Wyoming in five years and undecided, taking a lot of courses that were off a graduate track in anthropology and we had great professors in a number of areas and I've kind of maintained that curiosity and shifting gears is something that I'm happy to do work-wise but today um, my chief title is is as uh, executive director of this project I created called the Community Investment Trust which is um, putting a wealth building strategy in 100 cities and a million people over the next five to ten years that's my day job well you've had a life John that's just been filled with adventure. And I guess it all started in Laramie. And we're going to get to many, many of those unbelievable to me adventures. But it started in the really in the back streets of Laramie and exploring Washington Park as a kid, didn't didn't they? That's right. Yeah, it's um, I'm glad we had a good park right right across the street because it was my playground for sure. And your dad was a banker in Laramie. He was. Um, that that guy, that young kid, started two banks in in Mountain View and in Evanston, and my grandfather ran those, and then my my father became a banker independently of those banks in in Laramie for his whole career. You write in your book um, initially that um, you know, like many high school kids in Laramie, a lot of summer nights when the rain rain wasn't uh, coming down too hard, the thunderstorms were staying away. You spent it at Vitavu with friends. Yeah, Viva was, as soon as we could drive, we were up at Viva, rock climbing or hiking, um, drinking beer. Um, so yeah, we were, Laramie's blessed with being proximate to some really beautiful places. John, if you would, I've asked you to read a, a little bit about that that's in, in, you talk about in your book at a couple different times. And um, if you wouldn't mind, um, you're on the Niger River and we're gonna talk about that adventure in great detail here in just a little bit, but you come back to really why you decided to leave Laramie. And if you wouldn't mind starting the par reading the couple paragraphs that we talked about, I'd really appreciate it. Okay, I will. Um, let me do a quick preface because I mentioned a name in this <clears throat> in this paragraph, Mungo Park. Um, so Mungo Park, just quick background, was a Scottish explorer who was sent into the interior of Africa after several of, of his, you know, of, of people had been sent in 
and never seen again or died. So they, they found this young Scottish doctor and sent him in to find this great river that they didn't know. They knew existed, but didn't know its direction and didn't know much about it. But they perceived that there was great wealth in the interior of Africa in the late 1700s. So that's Mungo Park, and that's who I refer to here. We were following uh, for a chunk of the river, a big, big portion of the, the Niger River in Mali, his route. So we understood Park's restlessness, an endemic urge of the young in Laramie is to leave. Laramie is more than enough for a kid until it is not. Getting out of Laramie by road led to places by plane thousands of miles and months away. We would eventually leave town and keep going. And we did it over and over. It didn't matter how far from home we were. Once you passed the city's limit, you've left, gone. When you leave Laramie, you trust that you will return to the same place, the bright sunlight, the university's tall trees and old buildings at the heart of town, the sound of trains rolling through the night. Familiar names, family names on retail businesses. It makes leaving easy knowing it will be there when you return. It makes returning home as predictable as the morning sun rising over the Sherman Hills east of town. And hence begins your writings when you start to recall your leaving Laramie. John, tell me about your first desire to go on a, a serious adventure um, um, with maybe some of the friends that you had met in high school and with not a lot of money with not the um, assistance of a GPS or Google Earth or even Google at the time, yet you were ready to, ready to go and boy, did you ever. Uh, yeah, actually the first time I left with uh, three friends, three Larby high school friends. <clears throat> and at age 19, we went to Europe for the summer. And those guys, I was painting houses and mowing lawns and making money and uh, was set for doing that. And they they bought or they reserved my plane ticket because they know I'd eventually want to go. So a couple of weeks before they were set to go, um, we were meeting and and they and I said, "Boy, I wish I was going with you guys." And they said, "Well, we reserved you a ticket already." So we all went to Europe, which you know, in, in retrospect, was a huge adventure for for us at age nineteen to be roaming around Europe um, on the cheap, sleeping in parks largely. But that was the first overseas trip for me. And, and then it kept going. You write about travels to Japan, to Tibet a couple times. Um, the, the greatest adventures in your book, in my eyes, are, are riding your bicycle to um, Everest Base Camp. And then certainly the book, as you describe it, within a book of your time on the Niger River. Um, tell us more about um, some of your early adventures before we get to the, the larger adventures that you write about. Okay. Uh, you know... Southeast Asia was a real draw for a lot of us in, in Laramie at that time. We were working in restaurants and doing things. And, you know, a seed was planted by a couple older guys, you know, a few years older. Um, five years older is a big distance when you're young. Okay. But uh, so they come back with stories and it incubated kind of a wave of us going oftentimes not connected or planned to, to Southeast Asia, particularly Nepal and Thailand. And at that time, this was 1984, Tibet had just opened up for independent travelers. And when you're in Nepal at about 4,000 feet and going up to 18 or so trekking, you know, these mountains on the other side, you realize there's a, a step or a plateau there that goes from roughly, you know, 11, 12,000 feet to 18, 19 on the backside of the Himalayas. So it's an immediate draw and influence of, of the Tibetans to the Sherpa culture and all of Nepal is so pronounced that that just becomes a magnet so after traveling for a number of months with a, a girlfriend from Laramie, she went back to school in Eugene, Oregon, it, it happens. And then I kept traveling. Um, I need to make money. So I went to Japan and I bailed out of that kind of immediately because I was just too drawn to Tibet and moving and going into China and Tibet in the winter of 1985. That's, that ended up materializing into what I wrote about in a couple of chapters about a sky burial situation and, and yeah. discovering that, which is really a unique phenomenon of how they deal with the dead in a really interesting, humane way with, with uh, raptors. And, and then I took the Trans-Siberian, finally ended up back um, home 
and then left a few months later with a group of friends. And you would come back to Laramie then and in simplistic terms, hatch your next adventure. You refer to that often in your book. You would meet with friends. How did these, how did these come up? How did these incredible, you're not talking about adventures to Montana here. Um. <laughs> well, we, you know, we, we ran into each other, a, a number of us in, you know, Tibet or China during 1984, 1985. So we had an idea that we could bicycle from, from Lhasa to, uh, to Kathmandu. Um, North Everest Base Camp wasn't in the plan then, um, but a, co a couple of us shipped it off and went there just because it was towering above us. And it was just so um, appealing, you know, when we were gonna be there again to get that close. But, uh, you, you know, between Ivinson Street, you know, between a couple places we ate and worked and the Buckhorn Bar, a lot of ideas get get percolated. And there's always somebody that wants to do it and a handful that say um, they wouldn't do it in a million years, but maybe next year. I don't know. It's just that I think it's an adventurous spirit that existed at the time. You you write, John, in, in how you're laying the book out. You lay it out as a timeline and you talk about the book within a book, which is essentially your incredible journey. First of all, finding the very headwaters of the Niger River and then um, navigating through its whole course, mostly or oftentimes on a, on a canoe or a kayak, you carried in on your back. Who was the first in your, yeah, who was your first to hatch that idea? And tell us how you ended up then hiking to find the Niger source. Yeah, this, this came about, I think originally around a kitchen table. I was in Eugene, Oregon, um, well actually in Portland, at the time and living and working. And um, Laramie friends, one of whom had done uh, the uh, bike track with, with me, we were good friends. And a couple other friends had hatched it, I think at a dinner table at somebody's house. And they perceived that it was gonna be the, the last great interior African river, last great first descent. Um, and I, I had a good job. I had just got an advancement. I was you know, disinclined to, you know, jump jump into something but i just couldn't get it out of my head <clears throat> i went to a library in powell's bookstore in portland got a couple of books and i just i couldn't i couldn't sleep i was so excited about the prospect of doing it so we literally put that trip together in a month and left because we wanted to catch the high water of the river um, as it flows through mali and into niger niger and then into nigeria but the river dissipates into a inland delta in central Mali, and that can be dwindled down to, you know, just braided channels and isn't really um, movable um, for a portion of the year. So we needed to move quickly and left, I think in late, very end of September. And we ended up going, two of us ended up going for 19 weeks, five months. How could you have known the, the um, scale of this adventure that you were you were embarking upon yeah no we we didn't we didn't know um i mean we knew there were hippo um but you know zero experience except for maybe a zoo and i don't even remember seeing one in a zoo um but uh yeah we didn't have much information in fact we couldn't get maps i found a defense mapping agency out of santa barbara or some ventura somewhere there and got some maps that that uh, half the maps were said uh, these are defense mapping maps so obviously no Google Earth or GPS. Uh, and they said undocumented area. So the maps were essentially worthless until we got to Bamako, which is about 500 miles down the river out of Guinea. And we found an, an old uh, um, cartography shop, a French one, and we could get some maps for a few sections of, of Mali. But you know, after that, when we got to the end of Mali around Gao, uh, we, we found a roadmap, a Michelin roadmap, and we used that for just to mark where we camped when we got through Nigeria. But by Nigeria, you know, you're just going with the river. <clears throat> it's pretty easy, but the headwaters were completely a hiking adventure. I think we ended up hiking around 95 miles before we found the headwaters and then got to a point where it was wide enough to kayak. And we had sea kayaks, folding sea kayaks from a company in Vancouver. You met people along the way um, and you met um, humanity along the way, living perhaps in a way that they've lived for hundreds of years, and you interacted with them. How did how could that possibly have gone? How did that work for you? You know, it was all the way through Guinea, 
um, where it was really remote and there weren't roads. They thought maybe we were bringing roads and they hadn't, you know, there's no Peace Corps up there, Any anybody. I mean, you, you have to hike miles to get into these places. The people were remarkably um, embracing and friendly. Um, there's also always protocol with a chief, meeting a chief. They'd give us a ch chicken very often or have a chicken. And, um, you know, they had millet and oranges were grown. Uh, a lot of a lot of lot to eat, but it was dense uh, rainforest and isolated hamlets. You know, when I go on Google Earth now and I can see these places, they all have roads to them now. But this was in 1991 and 92, and you know, people were remarkably friendly the entire route. How did you communicate, John? Well, there were very often uh, not in the headlands, but further down in Mali, uh, my my travel partner Rick could speak some French. And then we learned some Bambara to be able to do basic, really basic, you know, just protocol conversations of politeness. But by and large, you know, it's a lot of pantomime and sharing things and laughing and, and getting by the best you can. Because obviously we didn't have these uh, Bambara or Malinke languages. By the time we got to Nigeria, there's plenty of people that, that speak English. Okay. Yeah, they're basically equatorial days, roughly, so 12 hours. And we would paddle um, 10, 11 hours a day um, and stop in villages when we had the energy because it was always fascinating to stop in a, in a village and, and meet people. But we needed to give as much as we were taking, you know, so we very often knew that we were going to be the circle of attention and people were going to gather around and it would, it would take some time to share, you know, our headlamps or our kayak paddles or a chief would want to actually try to paddle our boats, which we always let them do. Um, it took some energy, but as long as we were curious with them as they were with us, and we were, it was it always worked out great. And I had done one thing that I've completely forgotten now, but but I thoughtfully, you know, having been in more remote places before, I knew that you could always find a piece of paper or I could tear one out of my journal. And I learned to make like a box out of paper, origami, and then a a swan or a bird. So very often I would make a few of those and give them out to kids. And, you know, that was a, a good door opener for just friendly exchange. John, later you um, um, encountered, I guess, some tragedy in your life. And I want to talk about that briefly and then talk about what, what uh, brought you to writing this book. Um, this was somewhat after your, your, your adventure on the Niger River. You were overseas in the Czech Republic, um, on a train, went to get some coffee, and your life certainly changed again. Um, you're a quadriplegic as we speak today. Yeah, I'm. I'm what you'd refer to as a lucky quad because it's it, they, they, it's judged by where your injury is, and and I uh, fractured a C7 vertebrae in my neck. Um, but I'm what my friends in wheelchairs call a lucky quad because I I didn't sever my spinal cord, so I've got function below. No walking, but I've, I've got strong enough hands. This one's weak that I can kayak as long as I've got a couple of friends to put me in my kayak and push me out. Um, but yeah, I was, I mean, the, the quick story, I was back in the Czech Republic. I'd worked there for two years out of Prague and was back on a vacation and wanted to go to Berlin. And I'd never gone up to Berlin the time I was in Prague, but I'd been through Berlin earlier. So I was just like, let's, at the last minute, instead of staying in Prague, let's take a, a couple nights in Berlin. And we stopped in a, a town in the Northern Czech Republic, a town called Usti nad Labem, Usti on the Labe River. And, and I knew I could get a cup of coffee in this town. It was a German train and their coffee was expensive and not a very good, but I knew exactly where the coffee was in Usti. So all I remember was um, racing up the train with money, but not my passport or anything. And, and that's the last thing I remember. John, you made a decision to write a book. What percolated in you to want to put this down in prose? Um, well, I had written the, the Africa book in 1994. I'd finished it. And I had a New York City editor, Big Shot. I was living in Princeton, working in Trenton, New Jersey. And, and she took it under her wing and said, I know I can sell this, so let's go. And I got rejections from some of the big publishers. And she said, let's... Let's retool it and get it to this other group of publishers. And honestly, I was coached at the time to write a book about 
young guy quits his job and goes to a crazy adventure. And it really wasn't the book I wanted to write. I wanted to write more about nature and the people. So you know what? I never went in and talked with her again. And I just said, I'm kind of done with Africa, but I'd written it already, um, at least the version. So I had content and I'd written magazine articles about all the other trips, you know, kind of to survive in between travels. So I had content and really it became its own adventure to string a book together. And, you know, I'm not biking, hiking, skiing, climbing. So I've got some extra time when I'm not watching um, Wyoming football or the Broncos right. <laughs> or Josh <laughs> Allen or Josh right. Allen now. Um, I wish he was still going. But uh, yeah, I had time. So it became its own kind of adventure and project is to string these stories together. What do you help readers feel, John? I mean, you, you, you wrote this for your reasons. Someone like me picks it up and reads it. What, what are you hoping I, I take from the book? Well, number one, I hope that people feel the authenticities of the stories and that they learn something and they have fun with it. And, you know, to the extent that it kindles a, a sense of adventure, however big or small that is, that's cool. But, you know, more than anything, I just want people to enjoy, I, you know, during COVID, it's, it's perfectly good time to take a vicarious adventure. Um, but even after COVID, I think there's, there's places and times when you can see um, places that you can't see now. Molly, for instance, is incredibly dangerous now. And anything we would have done on the river, you just simply cannot do safely now because of Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, um, village turning on villages, much like the Balkans were. It's just, you know, it's uh, it's sad to think that you can't go back to these places and you can't go there now. So to learn about these fascinating cultures is something I wanted to share. Any more writing coming from you, John? Um, right now, my work is so intense with creating this real estate investment for low-income people around the country that I mostly write grants and work with cities. Um, but I've got some mothballed short stories and, and I'm working on a series of, of essays that just come to mind as I, you know, think of them. And there, you know, that's how I kind of get my head out of, of workaholic tendency is to, is to write some essays. So there's, there's, there'll be something else coming. I think I, I'm feeling pretty compelled to write a second book, whether it's fiction or essays or a combination, I don't know. What are you reading these days? Oh, wow. That's a, I've been reading a lot. Um, until football season came on, but uh, the, it interrupts all of our reading time, doesn't you know, it? I, 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 because of the book, I reached out to some people at the University of Wyoming Writers Program, and I discovered how remarkably um, powerful that that program has become. And and we had a great writer when I was in college. And, um, John Edgar Weidman was there for a number of years, and I've been rereading his work, um, but also some of the writers, um, Jeff Jeffrey Lockwood. And a guy that, that died last summer, um, when I was back home, um, a guy named Brad Watson, I'm reading his book. And so some of the writers that are at the University of Wyoming Writers Program are, are interesting to write. The other one that's sitting here that I'll, I'll mention is, this one's called Your Sister and the Gospel. And this was written by a friend of mine, a, a former board chair of Mercy Corps' daughter, who was teaching at University of Wyoming in the Religious Studies Department. This was published by by uh, Oxford Press, and it's called "Your Sister in the Gospel," and it's the life of Jane Manning Jane's, a 19th century Black Mormon who um, left slavery, um, got oriented towards this new church by a guy named Joseph Smith, um, migrated with him, um, and when he was murdered, she ended up following with Brigham Young to Salt Lake City. Um, so it's a story of post-slavery, migration west, and the Mormon culture with, with a black woman that's just, you know, it's fascinating. It's written by Quincy Newell, who moved from Wyoming to, to a liberal arts college in, in Massachusetts. John, I must wonder, COVID has impacted all of us. I'm guessing it's likely impacted you too. Yeah, it's been tough just seeing Portland, the city and the nation wrestle with it. The deaths, obviously, um, some close to home um, with people I know. And, and uh, so, yeah, it's been difficult. In terms of isolation though, um, I go to a wetland every day, one of two, read and get some sense of nature. But uh, 
Yeah, it's been it's been it's been hard for everybody. I think it's harder for me to just see the impact of other people that I'm not as personally impacted other than isolation, but I've been fine. At the same time, COVID has exposed kind of the underbelly of problems in the nation with respect to wealth gap and, and vulnerability. And the work that I'm doing with this community investment trust nationally has just taken off. So I'm on the phone with 15 cities now regularly coaching them on creating their own uh, real estate project that's in community ownership. Well, John, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us and, and sharing your sense of adventure um, for someone like me who never in his life would be willing to consider adventures like you have lived. It was just a fascinating read with Wyoming roots. Thank you so much for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you very much. This is a great pleasure and opportunity for me to spread the word about the book. So thank you. This program was funded in part by a grant from Newman's Own Foundation, working to nourish the common good by donating all profits from Newman's Own food and beverage products to charitable organizations that seek to make the world a better place. More information is available at newmansownfoundation.org. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.